Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew. And today we are talking about altar calls, and one specific, quote, altar call, unquote, in the Bible, where Joshua says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Uh, I think those words are often used in modern day altar calls, um, but let's define our terms here. Uh, Greg, what what would you consider an altar call? What is this phenomenon that we are <laughs> talking about? You know, it's interesting that Protestant churches don't have altars, so we're <laughs> a problem up front. But it's a, a practice that's developed in American Christianity and from then spread around the world that involves calling people to the front of the church, someplace generally toward the end of a sermon, evangelistic sermon, to give them an opportunity to commit their life to Christ. Now, there's problems with what I just said, theological problems and and um, grammatical problems, I suspect. But I I, th- I think it's that's fair enough, a fair enough explanation for most people. I, that's, I think that is it most people who are involved in the practice would say, yeah, it's, it's kind of like that. They might want to fine tune it a little bit. Uh, it, it seems to imply a certain kind of theology, although it doesn't necessarily require all the, uh, all the details we might want to read into it. Why would you call someone to the front of the church? Well, the, the obvious reasons were or are to get them away from distractions. So the counselor can talk with them one-on-one, to force a show of uh, an act, force an action, a demonstration of, of faith so that people are not content to sit back in their own hearts and minds and nod assent without really doing something that, well, might draw criticism from their friends, um, make them uh, the center of observation and such. But these, I think these are some of the reasons yeah, they've demonstrated that they made a choice yeah, by walking yeah. down. Now, if you're an Arminian, a semi-Arminian, or just a broad evangelical, you, you might not have a problem with that. There are those of us who do. Now, we, as a good Calvinist, Calvinists, we need to be really careful. Does man make choices? Absolutely. Every day we make choices. People who are listening chose whether or not to turn tune in right now or turn on right now listen to this thing and to stay with us or not. Scripture and Calvinism has never denied that man makes choices. The question is, where do those choices come from? I think most Christians will say, oh, well, they come from the heart. Yes, they come from the heart. So what's the nature of man's heart? Is it totally depraved before regeneration? Is it kind of depraved? Is it depraved in most areas except for, well, maybe one? Is there enough freedom left in that heart so the man can exercise his will to choose Jesus, to choose the fear of the Lord, to choose salvation. Uh, The Calvinist with scripture would say, no, um, every imagination of the thought of the human heart is only evil continually until we are born again. Being born again is not the fruit of choosing Christ. It's what brings us and enables us to choose Christ. But still, the call for a choice is not in and of itself bad. The, The offer of more counseling is not in and of itself bad. In fact, it's probably a good thing in most circumstances. Asking people to make a visible decision is not always a bad thing. I I think that, um, and feel free to to join in on this as you will, I think a couple of the reasons that Calvinists have objected to this one is it's a fairly recent invention for 1,700 years or more of, um, more like 1,800, of church history, um, there was no such thing, which may seem strange to people. How did the church grow and how did they evangelize without altar calls? Quite well, thank you. Uh, it, it is a modern invention. And two, because of the things it highlights and emphasizes, it, it does run the risk of suggesting that man's will is at some points unfallen. And that the appeal is not to the grace of God here, but to that good thing still left in man that he can exercise if only he would 
And so we're now having acknowledged that that's there and beyond divine sovereignty. We're not asking God to change his heart, or at least we're not believing that God by himself can change his heart. We're asking him to make a choice. If that's so, then we need to bring persuasion to bear. And I think this is what I would add to the list as the biggest problem that I have with altar calls personally, is that they are almost always an exercise in emotional manipulation. Yep. Yeah. That's what I was going to add. Every every time that I've seen them employed recordings, real life experience, whatever, it's always been along with music that is intended to inflame certain types of emotions and maybe mute other ones as well and more or less force a choice that they can then i mean less charitably that they could add to their roster of number of uh decisions made that year as a church but um it's it's most of the time i've seen it, it it's definitely been an exercise in in exactly what you said, Emily. The most apparent problem, I think, the most elementary problem with decisional theology is that ultimately it puts people's trust on the decision that they made rather than mm. on Christ. Yeah. Um, so even if we're not digging as deep as what is our anthropology, what do we believe is the nature of man before and after regeneration, the simplest question is where is our trust after we've had this experience? I have a cousin several years older than me, and he, in his youth, attended occasionally, I think, a Baptist church. And if you ask this gentleman today, are you a Christian? He will say, sure am. And he will name the place, the, the, the particular Baptist church. He will name the date, the morning service, and he will tell you that he responded to an altar call. The fact that there is absolutely nothing in his life that suggests that he knows Jesus, loves Jesus, or is intending to follow him in any area of his life um, seems to him totally beside the point. He did what was required once. He bought the insurance policy. He signed on the dotted line. So he's a Christian. He would probably admit he's not a very good one. But um, in terms of such theology as he has or had, he saved because he made the decision and, and can tell you exactly when. Can't tell you anything about Christ or a cross or substitutionary atonement or justification by faith or being born again. Even. But he can tell you he made a decision. Walked down which, the aisle. Which is also kind of interesting since that is the exact opposite implication of everything Finney said. Because later he would go uh go back up oh, but we haven't even talked about finney yet <laughs> let's introduce him before we start telling more stories about oh. <laughs> <laughs> well let's let's move in that direction and I, I hope we have at least thrown in enough uh caveats to say if you came to christ by walking down an aisle well, that praise, doesn't invalidate, that your doesn't invalidate it <laughs> praise god yes. a lot of people came to christ that way especially in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. um and and that's great but Praise the we're, we're asking about, and this is a place where we need to talk about ideas and ideas behind ideas and ideas behind practices. If uh, the altar call was absent for so long in church history, where did it come from? As best as I understand, as best as the records seem to say, it started uh, with uh, some Methodists uh, about the time of the Second Awakening in American history. That puts it... Um, late 17 early 1800s sometime in there uh the methodists began to use it not not in the modern form they invented something called the anxious sea the anxious bench uh and it did some of what the, the modern altar call was supposed to do if you felt particularly moved uh by the by the sermon with convicted of your sins you were invited to come forward and sit up front on a particular bench under the watchful eye of the pastor so there'd be no further distractions. And so when this was over, someone, probably the pastor, could come and talk to you immediately. And in the meantime, you could contemplate your sins and your need for Jesus. So it, it began there and, and largely on the frontier, but then it moved east. And Charles Finney picked it up. Charles Finney, matter of time, was born in 
1792, he died in 1875. He had been a lawyer. Uh, he had been a formal member of a Presbyterian church, but he knew nothing about Presbyterian theology, hadn't read the Westminster Standards. But he apparently had read the Book of Romans as part of his law assignments in those days, I guess. Um, the Bible was still considered required reading. You want to know how to construct an argument, you read Paul's arguments. Mm -hmm. this is Romans a, especially yeah, as Romans. a legal, yeah. legal formulation. Well, he did that, and somehow he believed he had come to Christ, and I cannot pronounce upon his soul's eternal welfare, but he sure missed the message of what Paul was saying, if that's if that's where he picked up his faith or what passed for faith. He decided very soon that God was calling him to preach. And so he he went before, uh, what do you call it, the Presbyterian Church, Presbytery? Mm -hmm. um, and um, said, uh, I, I, I want to be ordained. And they gave him a very superficial examination. Well, do you believe do you agree with the Westminster Standards? Because in those days, that was the mark of of being a pastor and elder anything. You had to you had to agree to the standards as they were then commonly received. And Finney's reply was something to the effect of, insofar as I am familiar with them, yes. What he didn't, <laughs> what he didn't say was, I've never read them. <clears throat> And um, they didn't inquire further, and he was ordained. And we, there's kind of a suspicion there. If Finney got by doing that, yeah. how many other pastors in that day said, uh, <laughs> yeah, as far as I know them? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> anyway, he, um, as he preached, he developed his own theology, and, and his books are available online for free in numerous places you go and read for yourself what he said i'm not making this up i've actually read enough of what he wrote to be thoroughly disgusted but you know when when someone gets a reputation for serving christ and there's and the reputation includes and there was this kind of fruit so many hundreds or thousands of people came to christ and there was this change this moral change this uh, religious change in people's life. You know, you, you hear that, you hear it from people you respect, you see it in church history books, and most people believe it because they don't have time to go back and do the original research and actually read what the guys wrote, said, preached. And it, you don't want to be disingenuous and think, oh, but they probably weren't really saved. Yeah. Like, it's, that's uh, kind of a sick place for you <laughs> to go immediately. No, we don't, we, don't want to, we don't want to jump there immediately. I heard good things about Finney for years, and even when I began to hear bad things, I, I still assumed, okay, well, he had some problems, but... What, what modern evangelist doesn't, you know, really. Right. But as I as I was as I read more specifically what he said and then went and read what he actually said in his own words, I was somewhat aghast because he passes on substitutionary atonement, he passes on justification by faith. He says basically these things are illogical and impossible. Uh God would be a fraud if he if he took this way of saving people, because People are sinners, and the way to be with the Holy God, have communion and fellowship with him, is to stop sinning. And just calling them righteous doesn't fix that. So what, what needs to happen is that people need to stop sinning. Now, Jesus set us a good example, and God's willing to apply the persuasions of his Spirit, which cannot be more than any other person's persuasions, because you can't touch the free will. And human nature then is uh, mal. Well, no, there's no such thing as human nature. That's the problem. <laughs> man does not have a set nature. Man makes his nature, makes himself by his choices. If you are choosing day by day to sin, then we call you a sinner. If you choose day by day to do righteousness, we call you a Christian. It's really that simple. And you simply need to understand this and understand the consequences. If you continue to be a sinner, you're going to hell. But if you want all of the good things that come with being a Christian, then you need to stop sinning. You need to in embrace Christ and receive entire sanctification for the moment. Of course, if tomorrow you go back to sinning, well, you were a Christian. Now you're not. Now you need to come back to Christ again. And so we go back and forth. Well, this is basically the the attitude of the rich young ruler who tells Jesus, all thy commandments have I kept. Yeah. The minute you think you're able to keep the commandments <laughs> in your own power, you've 
proven you didn't because that was a lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And pride and, and probably breaking every other commandment along the way, idolatry. So, so th- what Finney did to preaching, making it into persuasion and particularly emotional persuasion in practice, kind of de supernaturalizes the process of evangelism um, yeah he actually i don't know if i have the quote in front of me oh here i do actually here it is <laughs> this is this is from his lectures on revivals of religion he writes this a revival is not a miracle that is something about the powers of nature there is nothing in religion beyond the ordinary powers of nature it consists entirely in the right exercise of the powers of nature it is just that and nothing else when mankind become religious, they are not enabled to put forth exertions which they were unable before to put forth. They're, they only exert powers which they had before in a different way and use them for the glory of God. Now, revival is not a miracle, nor dependent on a miracle in any sense. It is a purely philosophical result of the right use of constituted means as much as any other effort or any other effect produced by the application of means. And so technique is everything. Creating revival is a science, just like selling vacuum cleaners. Ever had a Kirby salesman at the door? Um, <laughs> That's before my time. Yeah, we, we had one once and he didn't get in. But even that moment was, boy, you're persistent. <laughs> but that's how he sees it. Because man's nature is open to persuasion. It's in moral equipos. Well, it would be if man came into an environmentally clean uh, slate. That is, if there were not bad things around him influencing him to be bad, then you could just come up and the devil can lay down his arguments. You can lay down yours and yours are so much better that every man's probably going to come to Christ. The problem is we don't have that flat playing field. The man that you're witnessing to that you're evangelizing already is living in a world that's tainted by a corrupt social system. There's prostitution, there's drunkenness and alcohol, there's gambling, there's an unjust um, governmental system. Uh, you go down the list, there's, of course, black slavery was a thing. Um, all of these things combine to create a corrupt environment that your man has been subject to for 20, 30, 40 years. So in order to balance that persuasion already in play, you need to help things out a little bit. And so a little more a play to emotion to push things back into balance so that your man has a fair shot at choosing freely. Okay, the devil's played his cards heavy and hard and early. We're going to play some of God's cards, some of his Holy Spirit persuasion in the form of what you say of emotional manipulation. And then that puts the man in a place where he has to choose, but he does have to choose. You, you can't, in the long run, con him into faith. You can't hypnotize him. You, you can't subdue his will by your superior charisma. He actually does have to make the choice. You just need to get him in the state where that's possible. And uh, as Finney says, this is a science. It's something that's learned. It's something that could be taught. Um, and Finney was, as evidenced by the fact he wrote a book of it, was more than willing to instruct pastors, preachers, evangelists mm-hmm. on how to use these techniques. And these techniques were picked up by all of the other reform societies that were buzzing around America at the same time. We've talked a little bit about those, the temperance movement, the prison mm-hmm. reforms, all of that. So you had all of these groups using the same techniques to try and make man better, to try and fix society so that man could be better. And what's at the bottom of this is a theology that says that man's nature is implicitly good. The man man has a good heart. There's good in there someplace. No, there's not. Yes, there is. No, not. Yes, there is. I can I can feel it. Um, there's is, good in him still. I can sense it. Yes. <laughs> Basic romanticism, uh, before it really, I don't know, wasn't a place to have that label, but the roots there are in Rousseau and further back. But once, we, once we've admitted that man is basically good, or at least potentially good, or there's some good left in you, then the problem must be the environment. And here, for the most part, although not exclusively, uh, we're talking socioeconomic environment. 
Um, Karl Marx is only, what, 40 years off at this point. If that. But, yeah. And um, so th this idea of the economic system, this, this capitalist thing, social conditions, you mentioned some of the problems. But there was also the physical thing. This is always fun to talk about uh, because it usually catches teenagers by surprise. Uh, there was uh, a belief that certain sorts of foods and drink mm -hmm. were dangerous. Now, we all know about, about prohibition and all of that, which would really come to flower in the uh, in the 1920s. But it's, it had an early start. But a side-by-side -side with, with the fear of alcohol uh, was the fear of other sorts of eatings and drinkings, things that were too cold or too hot. Uh, red meat up front was really frowned upon. And red meat in those days played a, a hefty part in breakfasts, uh, bacon or steak and eggs and things like that. And the the urban myth of the day, the church myth of the day, was that red meat made young men... Um, Lusty? Yeah, that, thank you, produced sexual arousal and what generally follows with young men who aren't married. And so um, if, if we could stop having our young men or boys eat red meat and gave them something more nutritious to eat, then that would fix a lot. They'd be much more pure at heart. So a couple of people came up with ideas. There was a, a, a doctor who came up with the, uh, uh, the idea for breakfast food that would have all the proper nutrients and fiber and such. He was going to market it in the form of a, uh, of a wafer or, or a cracker. The man's name was Graham, the Graham cracker. Uh, about the same time, and, and of course, this whole era meshes with the whole obsession with prophetic speculation. There was a group of Adventists who also were, were afraid of the dangers of red meat and, in fact, of anything that wasn't kosher. But they were they were pushing even beyond the kosher laws. Uh, and uh, one of them came up with a, another alternative breakfast cereal. It, it consisted of taking corn and smashing it and toasting it and then serving it up with milk. The man's name was Battle Creek, Michigan. It came out of Battle Creek, Michigan. Michigan. His name was Kellogg. And then, of course, we have, and I can never remember whether the guy was um, Methodist or what. Maybe one of you remember. He was an elder in some denomination. I think he was Methodist, if you're thinking of who I think you're yeah, thinking of. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I always get wrong and get corrected. Uh, he was, uh, wine was suspect, even at the communion table. And so he came up with a way of uh, using non-fermented uh, grape of juices. Which um, hadn't been done technologically before, ever. No, it was it was a new invention, which surprises me. Hasn't there always been grape juice? Uh, no. No, because when you squeeze <laughs> grapes, it starts to ferment. That's just what happens. Yeah, unless you want to drink it right then, uh, yeah. particularly in Israel, when grape harvest came toward the end of the harvest season and you needed the the juice for Passover. It's got to be fermented. Sorry. Oh, oh, the man's name, of course, was Welsh. Welsh. Welsh's grape juice. So this this was a time when a lot of people were looking at the environment. The environment might mean social structures, institutions. It might mean your your financial status. It might mean what you're drinking or what you're eating, what you're having for breakfast. But if we could fix these things, whatever they are, get them out of the equation, then man will be free. And being mostly good at heart, somewhat good in heart, potentially good at heart, there's some good in there someplace, we can probably persuade him, or at least an awful lot of people, to make some good choices, to turn away from, I mean, get the alcohol out of the way, and the man will stop being a drunkard, get the red meat out of the way, and the young men will become chased. And, and so on down the line. And, take and the so, guns out of society. No one will be a mass shooter anymore. That's right. It's, you know, if we take the guns away, then nobody will be afraid. And then it's without fear, there's no violence. And yeah. And so begins the long history of American reform movements. I don't know if we can lay it all at Finney's doorstep, but he certainly crystallized it in something that was more or less a, a form of religious existentialism. You define your nature moment by moment by your free choices, 
And therefore, you are able to rewrite your nature, rewrite who you are as a person, simply by making the proper choices from here on out. It's, it's not existentialism in the sense that there were absolutes, man-made absolutes, masquerading as um, divine absolutes, but still. Uh, but you, you could make yourself into the kind of person you wanted to be. And therefore, the, pop, the church at large and the population at large could help everybody be like this and do this. You can start little societies in your hometown, in your county. County was very influential um, political block, social block in those days, more so than the states. But eventually it comes to the point of realizing that, yeah, if we're really going to pull this off, if we're going to get rid of slavery, if we're going to shut down the production of alcohol, if we're going to readjust distribution of income, if we're going to arrange women and have the vote, and so on, we need government power behind this. Uh, I mean, people are going to, if, if you leave it up to popular vote, people will vote against their best interest to maintain their vices because that's where they are. But once we're able to get the right laws passed and we get we dismantle these things and get rid of them, then everybody, then they'll be the sigh of relief and they'll be so much happier. And they'll thank us and they'll be glad that we did it. And this will be the beginning of marvelous freedom. Uh, social utopia will arrive. Or as uh, Finney says, um, he basically, oh yeah, here he is. If the whole church as a body had gone to work 10 years ago and continued it as a few individuals, whom I could name, have done, there might not now have been an impenitent center in the land. The millennium would have fully have come in the United States before this day. And this is the abolition movement as well. <laughs> Sometimes yes. it's it's easy to give that one a pass because obviously slavery is horrible. Right. But the same political the motivations, same the same theological motivations were pervasive throughout that movement, which is why you have individuals here and there who would say, yes, I am so anti-slavery. The only thing I hate more than slavery is abolitionists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, sometimes with justification. Abolitionists admitted terrorism in the person of John Brown, but that's another discussion for another time. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps it isn't, because this is what happens when you become firmly convinced that your one pet principle defines the human condition, the human need, the need for salvation, and what God's all about in your time and era, then everything needs to serve that point, whether it is women's rights or prohibition or abolition or um, readjustment of uh, redistribution of income, uh, whatever, and I'm sure prison reform, whatever it is, if you're not for this, then you're on the wrong side. You are God's enemy at this point. And you may be deluded and you may be mouthing platitudes taught to you by people you shouldn't trust, but the fact is you're in the way. And therefore, in the long run, there are no innocent bystanders. You may think you are. You may think this isn't even your struggle. You've done nothing. You're not involved. But if you're not, as I used to say, my generation, part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so in the person of John Brown, some Unitarian Transcendentalist ministers in Boston, created terrorism. Go out and kill some innocent people to show everybody that you're not messing around and that everybody needs to get on the ball and everybody needs to change or more innocent people will die because, you know, they're not really innocent. They should be out there doing something right now. It's that serious. It's that important. And because we are so absolutely dedicated to this particular movement, we are absolutely righteous. We are the good guys. And being the good guys, whatever we decide to do, whatever we have to do, whatever fate lays upon us, it's for the kingdom of God. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And it's frightening. Mm -hmm. It is terribly frightening. And we still see it today, although less and less the name of God or Jesus is used. But still, uh, love, compassion, mercy, human rights, dignity, things, things that are most certainly Christian inheritance, Christian vocabulary are used to provoke people to social movements to fix the one thing. And if you're not on the side of this movement, you're the enemy. And uh, they can say and do horrible things to you with a clear conscience. Uh, they believe they're right. And so this is where Romanticism, Transcendentalism have led us, or Marxism has led us, Progressivism. Uh, in the name of, by, by saying this thing that seems noble, man is basically good. Wow, isn't that great and sweet and noble and uplifting? 
it's one of the most horrifying things imaginable because it's a license to destroy everybody who stands in the way of your little narrow vision of making the world good. Mm. So can't lay it all at the doorstep of Finney, but he did not help. He systematized, he popularized, and um, it looked good. It looked good. Lots of people walked those aisles, came to the anxious bench or later came to the front of the front of the church building or wherever he had, he'd set up his preaching. But when it was all over, Finney was able to look back on the fruits of his labors, and he found that most of the people who had come to Christ didn't go to church anywhere. The, the region he had preached through was called the burned out region in New York because people were burned out in religion. They'd gotten excited. But you know what? If that if excitement is your religion, then you what can't you be need, excited all the time, all your life. <laughs> it's just yeah. exhausting. It's exhausting. It doesn't work. And, and, you need, and as with any drug, you need more and more mm. to get the same high. And so this is also the region where most of the cults, I mean, there's some that we know about because they're still with us. There are all kinds of weird cults and, and mm-hmm. communes and attempts to create utopia that sprung out of this region in those days. Uh, Mormonism being one obvious example, but there were many others. Because people were just looking for something weird and different, exciting, that had that religious twang, and they knew they weren't going to find it in church. So people deserted churches. And Finney, at the end of his life, had to admit, and he did, that it, his labors were mostly worthless. He sowed the wind and weeped the whirlwind. And, of course, he blamed his conference for not staying with it, but that, that, that's what you get. Now, given this, and given his take on and human beings, there's one other thing I, I want to throw into, into the equation. On at least one occasion, he was asked, well, what about small children? Because, of course, mm. Finney's arguments are arguments for adults, for big people, people capable of rational thinking, thinking like a lawyer. Uh, and, and even his sermons would have been more... Um, would have had more depth than a lot of what passes for sermons in our age. But what about small children who can't follow those kind of arguments and aren't open to that kind of persuasion? This is, this is his response. All that can justly be said, dot, 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 is that if infants are saved at all, which I suppose they are, they're rescued by the benevolence of God from circumstances that would result in certain and eternal death and are by grace made heirs of eternal life. But after all, it's useless to spec- speculate about the character and destiny of those who confessedly are not moral agents. It's from his lectures on systematic theology, um, 40. Not moral agents, not human. So his basic his argument was, well, I guess they're saved, but... Um, but more because that makes us feel good about the character of God. Yeah, uh, that's about it. Because uh, he says, his language is interesting. They're rescued by the benevolence of God from circumstances that would result in certain and eternal death. Not not from a corrupt nature inherited from Adam, because he didn't believe in that. Mm-hmm. They hadn't sinned yet if they, they weren't moral agents. Yeah, they haven't sinned, but the circumstances into which they would would grow up, or if they were if they died in the womb into which they would be born, uh, would likely issue in them becoming sinners and going to hell. So uh, well, God's probably does something with them. So I guess He saves them, but speculation. Who knows? I mean, they're not even moral agents. Well, what's so interesting about that is that he basically makes an argument uh, until he gets to the end that is almost Calvinist in its underpinnings. <laughs> oh, well, the, God is so benefit, benevolent and great, gracious that he saves them from circumstances that would certainly lead to their death. <laughs> right. So why does he stop being benevolent and gracious once you get past a certain age <laughs> yeah and plus the the grace of god is totally unconnected with christ yeah it's yeah. god simply doing things arbitrarily without foundation yeah, well god's a good old boy and he does stuff like that all the time. because i would wouldn't you 
I'm a god, I'd save children. Now, Calvinism traditionally hasn't come down really very clearly on what happens to um, children who die in infancy. But where covenant can children are concerned, I think the consensus is pretty firm based on David's confession that they will not come back to us in this life, but we will go to them, covenant children per se. This for the rest, there's been an argument back and forth, which I don't want to get involved in. Well, not um, the judge of all the earth do right. Earth, yeah, the judge of all the earth will most certainly do right. And um, that's that's not for us to go there. We, On the one hand, we no. don't want to say I mean, that those, those who are abort babies by the thousands are the greatest evangelist of all time. However, I mean, the Westminster even says, you know, elect infants. Elect, right, elect infants. And it doesn't specify which, who those are. It again, it leads <laughs> it up. It leaves it up to God's sovereignty. Right. And I think that's what we need to do as well. So well, we don't want to be a discomfort to those who are outside the faith. God, God is good. God is merciful. But we cannot pin him down on things where he has not promised. So I want to be very careful there. On the other hand, there are some things we can say because God has been very clear. And th that has to do with this so-called age of accountability. Now, um, let me ask you what you two have heard. I, I apparently went went dark for a, a couple decades and lost track of what uh, evangelical society was saying. What are you told or what do you hear is the age of accountability now? Uh, I've never heard a firm age posited. Roughly. It's very I much a, well, it. It depends on the person you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So like you can have a, a four-year-old who professes faith and yeah, that's perfectly valid. And, but if they're like eight and maybe they get to 13 and they want to rededicate, then yeah, they, eight probably wasn't good enough. And Yeah. When, when I was young and listened to a lot of Christian radio, uh, the impression I got was that as soon as a child was capable of saying, I believe in Jesus, or I love Jesus. Um, the, the child was at least old enough to know right from wrong and to know what sin was and to recognize his or her need for a savior and to ask Jesus into her heart. And this is why there were uh, backyard clubs and, and VBSs that were evangelistic and such, not not for the nurture of covenant youth, but to reach out to to small children and get them to, to ask Jesus into their heart, make some kind of profession of faith. I, I remember the Left Behind series. Oh, yes. Unfortunately. Uh, I never read it. Uh, I mean, I, I scanned a few pages here and there in the Barnes and Noble. But um, I remember I think I watched, my entire I generation was movies. scarred wow. by the movies. Yeah. But at some point, someone told me, and so I, I, I believe this is correct, maybe you know, that when the rapture happens in those books or in the movie, um, it takes away not only professing Christians and small children, it takes away teenagers as well. You, I don't remember that. Okay. So Well, there was the there was a whole parallel series of books about the kids who were left behind. Ah. Okay, so some some yeah. did stay. All right. Yeah. Um but it, what whatever the case, I am now hearing, as you say, 13, 14, 20. This is frightening. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his books be pure, whether it be right. The Bible leaves no such vagueness. But but here's the thing. Uh, yes, we're endangering individual souls because we're not telling small children the gospel. That's horrible. But it, it gets worse because what we're saying is if the child's not a moral agent, we're saying the child has no relationship with God. He, she is not the image of God, does not have uh, the work of the law in his heart, has no voice of conscience as we understand it. And we're even saying he lacks a willing agency. Yeah, yeah. So uh, pretty much on all fronts, we're saying the child's not human. Now, what happens when the, when the church says these two things? The most important thing in man's social religious life is his ability to choose freely without coercion. And secondly, and children, by the way, are not really human. What happens choice. when you put pro-choice together with children that aren't human and you let that percolate? 
for about 300 years. And you let it percolate in a society that uh, was once Christian and quickly just kind of forgot about it all. Yep. You know, some some people will say that the, the church is always readily influenced by the world. There's truth in that. But in the long run, the church is the center of the world. It's where God meets with man. And what happens in the church has far more uh, long-reaching effects than anything the world does. And when the church, in her worship, enshrines principles of pro-choice and don't bring your children along, we should not be surprised when the world picks up on that and says, oh, thank you. We don't you. need them. Yeah. Yeah. Let us take note of that. We will proceed along according to your religious theological advice. It is most frightening. And honestly, until we repent of these things, it seems a little disingenuous to ask God to judge the abortionists. We've kind of set them up for it. And it's also leaves us, leaves uh, our, our own teenagers and 20-somethings in the lurch. We've taught them a theology that says that their choice is the most important thing and that children are not that big a deal. And so when they get into trouble, to use an old expression, are we surprised that that appearance, the appearance of righteousness can be more important? Not having anyone find that out, not letting mom and dad ever know, hushing this up quietly. Are we surprised that, that they consider these real options? Yeah. I mean, you you end up with that still in, in very extreme conservative patriarchal circles where mm-hmm. you basically end up with someone who their church community is basically will help you out as long as you're living a holy life and as long right. as you've never made any mistakes and as long as there's nothing weird or bad on your record. So people, even in really conservative societies, get driven to abortion clinics by people that are thinking of the best for them, quote unquote. Yeah. 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 And the... The idea, too, that comes out in those circles of you are responsible for the behavior of your children and they stay in your house until they are moved out or married. Well, obviously moved out, but only if they're a boy. They can only move out on their own if they're a boy. If they're a girl, they have to stay in your house till they're married. We talked about this a little bit (laughs) in the last episode. But there's this idea that you're so responsible for leading your family properly that the moral agency of the children, the fact that these children are growing up into adults who are going to have to make choices, who have to make choices day by day, whether you notice it or not, to live righteously or not. And I'm kind of, I'm using that language of choice because we do make choices, Mm -hmm. but we've emphasized, we've put push the idea of choice so far away in those circumstances that we don't recognize the real, the real choices that are being made. Does that make any sense? I kind of, yeah. of it. Um, I, um, as I've said many times, I'm a Calvinist. I receive the three forms of unity and with, the, with one or two really minor exceptions, mostly pertaining to the Sabbath day, I embrace the Westminster standards better than most Presbyterians do. Honestly, I do believe in six day <laughs> creation. And yet, I see an awful lot in the Reformed Presbyterian tradition that reduces that tradition to the five points surrounding man, sin, and God's sovereignty and salvation, infant baptism, and all the things we're not. We're not charismatics, we're not dispensationalists, <laughs> and we're not pre-mill, we don't do altar calls. And that seems to define us. And you may notice that the thing, the name that I didn't use anywhere was Jesus. Um, Calvinism itself becomes, Calvinism in quotes, becomes a a substitute for a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. I believe these things. I know these things. I know the technical vocabulary. I can tell you where in the confessions these things are found. I maybe even know a few Bible verses to back them up. So that makes me a great Christian, right? That's no, it makes you law. very. It makes you a very accountable. Accountable Christian, Christian. yeah. Does, but even then, it's all law. Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no gospel there's, in there. There's no gospel it, at all. I mean, you can, you can say, "I know the gospel." Here it is. But if you don't believe it, if you don't live in terms of it, if you don't embrace Christ as your Savior, as He's offered in the gospel, 
simply knowing all about him is, yeah, it's just one more piece of legalism, one more law thing. And when you can look at the character of a congregation and see that it's marked by the, the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, drunkenness, witchcraft, idolatry, all those things, it's a pretty good hint that although they may be formally orthodox, they have reduced their orthodoxy to a piece of legalism. Mm -hmm. Believe this and live. Whole lot, you know what? Believe this and live is a whole lot easier than do this and live. <laughs> <laughs> and just as much a lie. There's the danger of this in worldview education mm. that's kind of sprung up a lot in the past 10 or 20 years, I think, that we need to believe the right things about the world and make sure our kids have a Christian worldview and Jesus might not make it into the curriculum. Yeah. Oh, I am now thinking of the books on worldview that I know and how right you are. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, Name sudden, names. Name, no. <laughs> sudden dawning realization of something you should have noticed a long time ago. Um, but, you know, I mean, you ever, you ever reread a book that you thought was good when you read it five years ago? And yeah. <laughs> oh, Aragon. Aragon. Oh, I meant theologically, but yes, oh. Aragon. That counts. <laughs> yes. Oh, but yeah, I've done that. And I won't even tell you whose book it was. It sounded really great at the time because I was reading it from where I was with the problems I was facing mm -hmm. in, our, in our church community, our school community particularly. Uh, this is a good antidote to what I'm seeing. It would take a few years, it took about five years, to go back and look and say, oh, wait a minute. Now, let me look at it from this angle. Oh, what in the world did I just give my approval to? Oh, he said that? What he's actually saying? Oh, wow. I mean, at least when you read Chesterton, you know he's going to be wrong on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and loudly wrong about it, too. Yeah. And kind of and he'll, hilariously wrong. Hilariously wrong. Yeah. He'll, let you, he'll let you know that he, he, he doesn't pretend anything. You know he's Roman Catholic. You know the time and place he lived. You know his opinions, which he takes to be gospel oftentimes. But he's entertaining, at least. He's well-educated and well-read and really good with rhetoric. Um, but, uh, yeah, back, back to gospel. And so what was it then that Joshua was actually saying? What we usually do, what people usually do is they grab that one phrase, choose you this day whom you will serve. Actually, it's dot, dot, dot. Choose you this day who we will serve. <laughs> dot dot dot. There's but as, a lot before and a lot after that. <laughs> yeah, but as for me and my house, we will we will serve the Lord. Interesting that my house still makes it in because there's a covenant claim. But this is what he he's saying, and it it this is chapter twenty four of Josh. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he gathers the the nation together and recounts their redemptive history back to the time of Abraham and Terah when they served idols. Tell us how God intervened sovereignly, brought Abraham across the Euphrates, gave him Isaac into Isaac Jacob, and so on. Tells about their descent into Egypt, and then how he brought them out, and their wars on the on what at that point was that side of, of uh, Jordan. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and dwelt in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted not, do you eat now? Therefore, fear the Lord. So, Historical prologue, statement of, of suzerainty, historical prologue, God's revelation of himself in their past history, and now the stipulations. Fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, that is, on the other side of the river Euphrates. So there were people who had brought idols with them, members of, of Abraham's sheikdom, which numbered in the thousands. Some, some of them had brought their idols along, the little they still, those things were still circulating after all this time. And then they picked up more in Egypt. Uh, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. <laughs> like, take your pick. You can have any of these false gods. <laughs> yeah, you are absolutely free to choose any false god you like. Whom you will serve, whether the gods that your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you can serve the ancient false gods or the new pop false gods. You can choose any god you want. That's the point of choose you whom you will serve. He'd already told them they ought to serve Jehovah. That was a command. That, was that a wasn't command. a choice offered. <laughs> no, it was not. Well, you know, Yahweh would love to have you if he just come down. He's waiting right here with open 
fear the Lord. This is your obligation. This is the whole duty of man. But if not, then let's talk free choice. You can choose the gods of your fathers, Abraham, Terah before him. You can serve the gods in Egypt. You can serve the new gods of Canaan. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As I say, it is somewhat remarkable that uh, my house still is in there in most of the posters and Christian memes and things, because it is a covenantal statement. He does not say, as for me, I've chosen to, free, to serve the Lord. I've talked to my wife and she's on board. She's made her choice. And our older kids, they're with us. They've come to Jesus. And our younger ones, we you know, we're we'll still praying. We'll let them decide. We'll let them decide when the time comes, but we're praying for them. And then the little one, well, who knows? But uh, you know, she's hardly a moral agent, but we're hoping. <laughs> There's none of that kind of nonsense he chooses for his household. Now, does he choose eternal life for all of them? He chooses the path that is the path to eternal life, but apostasy is a real thing. And so in that respect, this is less a subjective claim as it is an objective one. We are submitting ourselves to the terms of the covenant. And since he's saying it, he means I sincerely, but he does not presume to read the hearts of his family just to know what where they're standing as far as he can tell. And what track they're on, and that it's head of the house, he's making the commitment for the family. They don't, His they family don't, is officially a Christian family. It is a Christian family, you know, which, which in itself uh, brings all kinds of bells. Can you do that? Can you have a Christian family? Well, can you have a Christian church? Really? <laughs> can you have a Christian rock band? Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what are we here? We're talking covenant. And they are covenanted. Well, now what happens next is really interesting. The people, verse 16, the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Wow, isn't that the kind of response that every evangelist wants? The whole crowd saying, no, 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 don't try to turn us off. Don't tell us to call, count the cost. We've counted the cost. We're going to serve the Lord. We're on the Lord's side. Let's all start singing that hymn, guys. <laughs> but what does Joshua say? And Joshua says, you can't serve the Lord. <laughs> That's uh, not what they tell you to say in, in preaching school, I bet. No, I don't think so. For he's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. Now, he's not. Joshua's not saying that God doesn't forgive sins. We, we've seen enough of that uh, in uh, God's self-revelation in, in the Torah and Deuteronomy, especially, that God defines himself as the one who has mercy upon his people from generation to generation, who's merciful and forgives sins. What he's saying is, you can't say it and not live it, because God's going to hold you accountable. God's going to take your confession and your oath seriously. You're coming near to God in a covenant oath. Now, I can't see your hearts, but God can. And if your heart isn't in this, if you don't mean this, and if you're, if it's not a real thing, it would be better for you never to have sworn the oath. It would be better for you to walk away right now than to simply say the thing and then live a different way because God won't brush it off. You can't say to God later, well, you know how I talk. Oh, it was a moment of, of emotional extremes. Oh, you know, I, I, that was me then. This is me now. Oh, I, I have, I've acquired more religious information than I have the time. Surely I'm free to change my mind and choose the best course according to my current information. You can't do that with God. And so don't, it, it, he does tell them, count the cost. When the people say, oh, we didn't know that. Yeah, you're right. We better not. No, the people say, <laughs> nay, but we will serve the Lord. They insist. And Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourself that you've chosen the Lord to serve. They said, we are witnesses. That's a covenant act. They just swore an oath and they called themselves as witnesses and they admit it. This is a legal transaction in blood. And Joshua I, I said- love, I love how Joshua is just like, I've lived with you guys. You guys are- <laughs> you're, you're, you're 
witnessing against yourself here. <laughs> yeah. And he said, and, and that follows with this. Now, therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Okay. That was brilliant. Great speech. All those little idols, throw them out now. Burn them, smash them. Get rid of them now. Can't go on like this. You can't halt between two opinions. You can't serve two gods. The people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. And God and Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and ordinance. Check them, and he wrote the words in the book of the law, and as he adds to the Torah, that's another discussion, and um, uh, took a stone and set it up there under the oak. It was by the sanctuary of the Lord and said unto uh, the people, Behold, the stone shall be a witness to us, for it hath heard the words of the Lord, which he spake to us, which shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest you deny God. <laughs> they just said they were going to be witnesses. We got, what, two, three million people. And Joshua says, yeah, you're with Never mind. Let's get a rock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this rock, it heard things too. Joshua, the, the, the rock isn't sentient. No kidding. <laughs> it still may be a better witness than you guys are. We'll see how this plays out. He, I, I, I think he went away hopeful, but perhaps unconvinced. And the first chapter of Judges suggests that they did a pretty good job of walking with the Lord. Although in Othiel's day, and Othiel was a younger man, but during his days, apostasy set in for a little while. And uh, God used... Uh, kings of Mesopotamia to uh, chastise these people and put them back on track for a while. Mm -hmm. But we're coming up on, on uh, Judges next, and that'll be a roller coaster of up and down, back and forth, round <laughs> and round. Yeah. So again, once again, we, and this, see, this is the problem. Yeah. We're, 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 we're kind of in the Old Testament. And, and all the ending <laughs> notes are not happy. <laughs> because Jesus hasn't come yet. Right. We're waiting for Jesus to come. And... Uh, you know, Genesis begins with God created heaven and an earth, and it ends with Joseph in a coffin in Egypt. Uh, Deuteronomy ends with, here's the word of the Lord, ends with Moses dying and no prophet like him rising again. It's, it's, you're kind of, uh, judges. We're, we're taking the land, and it ends with, the, and the Levites are completely blowing their job as pastors. There are some, there are some bright notes. Ruth comes to mind. Mm -hmm. We'll get to eventually. But we're waiting well, for Jesus. Yes. So for tonight, shall we close up with some recommendations? Uh, since we mentioned G.K. Chesterton, I'm going to go ahead and recommend his essay, A Piece of White Chalk, which is worth reading for all of our ragging on Chesterton tonight. <laughs> I don't know that essay. What's it about? It's about Gilbert Keith walking out and obtaining some parcel paper to to draw on on his walk as he's rambling about the countryside and of course parcel paper is brown and he needs something that is not brown to write on a pencil won't show up very well so he obtains a piece of white chalk and it's a meditation about the nature of virtue and it's fun it's it's great he he says he he goes out and he draws a cow but of course anyone could draw a cow so he didn't really draw a cow he drew the soul of the cow <laughs> Which I feel like is what I have to claim for all of my drawings because they do not <laughs> represent the physical reality very well. <laughs> okay. Brian, um, you got something? I will go ahead and recommend another podcast, actually, that I just started listening to last week. It, it, it's been around for years, but uh, this is just me finally getting on the bandwagon. It's called Colts. And it is disturbing in all of the ways you'd expect uh, a <laughs> podcast that explores cults to be. I think they start with the uh, the Manson family. So, mm. you know, nice, cheery start. And, you know, listener discretion advised. They remind me at the start of each episode. <laughs> uh, they do go into uh, some unfortunate details. But it's uh, it's been interesting to see the the different ways that people play on psychology, and uh, if we want to make the tie into tonight's episode, emotional manipulation, even to and the hunger their... for religion, exactly. 
uh, to build up their follower base and, and to gain earthly power. So it's 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 been very intriguing. I think I'm on episode 16 or something like that. I don't know. Cool. How long are the episodes? I believe each episode is an uh, it's roughly an hour. And then mm -hmm. most of the time it, it each cult is split up into two episodes. OK. So if you're like me, you could listen to an entire cult's worth in an hour because I listen at 2x speed. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my daughters. Well, that reminded me, I, I didn't have anything that's just my way, but that reminded me of a book that I think you both read in high school. I don't know if you did. Because uh, you were only there one year. Uh, Psychological Seduction. Which year oh, were you yep. there? I was okay. there for that. Yeah. You were there that year. Okay. Psychological Seduction by William Kilpatrick. Uh, You've actually recommended this before, so oh, I think I have to. Oh, does it still to. count? Um, I, I right. double recommended things. Yeah. Agree. We'll let right. it slide. Well, let, let me start <laughs> here, and then I'll recommend another one. Um, it's it, it, it's not about using psychology seduction. to seduce. It's about <laughs> psychology being seductive. Mm. Seeing uh, as how you have your high schoolers read it. Yeah. 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 This is not lessons in seduction. This is um, how psychology will seduce you away from the gospel if you're not very careful because it does offer an alternate diagnosis of man's problem and then may or may not offer a solution to said problem, depending on the nature of the problem. The problem is, you know what? The fact that you're the product of millions of years of evolution means you're screwed and uh, all you can do is learn to accept yourself as you are and hope everyone else does. So I'll, that'll be $50. Well, yeah, more like 150 these days. Uh, but uh, the author is himself a psychologist or psychotherapist, and he's a uh, Roman Catholic Christian. There's one kind of weird chapter about suffering that I would th think you could probably skip. But uh, the, my students who have read it have enjoyed it and found it pretty simple, straightforward, and somewhat reminiscent of the uh, of the style of C.S. Lewis. And speaking of Lewis, I will also jump on the G.K. Chesterton bandwagon <laughs> and recommend uh, a chapter called The Ethics of Elfland. Uh, from Orthodoxy? From Orthodoxy. Uh, I am I overdue for a reread of Orthodoxy. Yeah, I'm just realizing I am too, because I don't remember much of the book right now, but I remember this one chapter because it gets quoted by people that I read. Ethics of Elfland. So uh, what what is it about fairy tales and imaginative and fantasy literature that makes it such an easy vehicle for the gospel and why do, mm. why do we not want to go there sometimes or how do we try to twist it because it is such an easy vehicle for the gospel why do we try to build our own gospel on it but there's some i believe that's the chapter where he talks about god's providence hmm. and oh why did, yes why but, does the sun rise because mm -hmm. god says that was do great again. do it again <laughs> oh great still do it again that's yep. fantastic. Do it again. Uh, over against the so-called laws of nature. So anyway, there you go. Two for one. Even <laughs> if it's a little stale and used. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for this conversation. We've, we've gone over time, but it's been well worth it, I think. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely witted husband. Thank you to our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to support us financially, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Rumble, YouTube, Goodreads. Not as Halting Towards Zion as uh, I think me and Brian individually are each on Goodreads. Mm -hmm. So yeah, check us out there. Tell us some books you want us to read. <laughs> Thanks for listening. See you next time.